everyone. Welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I'm going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, it is definitely going to be a slimy friend of ours because we are covering the oh so wonderful slug. This, of course, is a very special listener episode dedicated to Adelaide, Mackenzie, Jules, Fred, Elizabeth, Ashley, Milo, and Hal. It is worth mentioning that many of you requested sea slugs, but we are first going to do slug in general before we go to the specifics. If you would like to request your very own animal, you can do so by going to relaxwithanimalfacts.com and going to the Animal Request tab. There is also a Patreon at patreon.com slash relaxwithanimalfacts, where you can get extra content from the show, including ad-free episodes and exclusive episodes. A huge shout out to George Vlad, who is the reason why we have all of the ambiances on the show. And so I have left his YouTube in the description, and I encourage you to go subscribe and check him out. If you are a new listener, I welcome you with open arms, and if you are returning, you know exactly what I am going to be asking of you. I have three primary exhortations for you. The first is that you put on a pair of shoes that you do not mind getting a little dirty. We are going to be needing those for where we are going today. My second exhortation, which is perhaps one of the most important, is that you realize perhaps where you are carrying some tension. Is it in the neck, the shoulders, the legs? It can be quite difficult to relax when we are stiff as a board. Once you have noticed where you carry your tension, do your best to imitate maybe a piece of jello. Really go for the gusto here, do an Oscar award winning impression of it. The third thing I encourage you to do is to give your mind permission to wander and journey with me into the Amazon rainforest where the slug resides. The symphonies or the coming together of sounds that can be found in places like this around the world can be mesmerizing. Sound is of course not the only way in which these environments, and while we are here today, we could have been in many other places around the world. That is because slugs can occupy pretty much anywhere that is damp or wet. The term slug is used to describe any mollusk of the class Gastropoda, and specifically it is the creatures within this class that either do not have a shell, or the shell has been significantly reduced to maybe just something internal. The term mollusk refers to something that is soft-bodied but oftentimes encased in a protective shell. The slug, of course, is one of these mollusks that has no outer protective shell. And so when we use the word slug, it typically refers to a land snail, but it can be used of other things like the sea slug, for example. These are particular marine gastropods that many of you guys like that we will, of course, cover in a future episode. There are a number of different species of slugs, and so we will have to do very broad sweeping generalizations of them all. But just know that there is a great variety here. Some in the tropics, some that love to damage your local gardens, some that are in moist habitats on the land, but one of which is a freshwater species. So saying the word slug is kind of like saying cat. Well, are you referring to a lion, a house cat? It is one of those things that has a great bit of vagueness behind it. But I find it helpful to work from the general to the specific. And so let's talk about what makes a slug a slug. A slug's body is typically around 80 to 90% water. 
This, of course, makes things like salt very difficult to deal with. They are specifically vulnerable to something called desiccation, which has to do with extreme dryness. Creatures like snails have that outer layer to protect themselves from this dryness. The slug, however, only has protective mucus. They will continuously generate layers of this protective mucus to prevent excess moisture from leaving them. That is why slugs can typically be seen after rain. The rain has soaked into the ground, it is moist, and so they move along without being exposed to those very harsh temperatures and conditions. And by harsh, I mean specifically to them. They prefer places that are shaded out, like under rocks or logs, and these little crevices will allow them to survive much longer than if they had no cover at all. So let's talk about those layers of protective mucus. On their feet, there are two main types of mucus that are there. Both of these types are fibrous and rich. This allows them to not slip off when they are sliding along, let's say, bark or other such surfaces. It allows them both to have a very good grip on some surfaces and to be quite slippery on others, like, let's say, on the inside of a predator's beak or mouth. They have a chance of sliding out of their predator's mouth, kind of like us trying to hold a bar of soap if we squeeze it a little too hard. The mucus also does not have that pleasant of a taste for many creatures, and so this will be a main deterrent for them. Kind of like many butterflies that have this very bitter taste to dissuade predators from eating them. Every slug has four multifunctional tentacles, all of which are retractable. Two of these tentacles are going to be for tasting and touching, and the other two for seeing and smelling. It seems as though they do not have a tentacle or anything for hearing. So while we as human beings have noses and eyes and hands, the functions of these body parts are instead tentacles for the slugs. And these tentacles can work apart from one another. This means that they can smell all around, all while they are looking directly at you. And intuitively, as these are sensory organs, they can be quite sensitive. That is why maybe when you were a kid and you try to touch the eyes of a snail or a slug, they quickly retract back into their heads and wait a little bit before popping back out again. And this retraction is important for them because they are not exactly the best runners. While they can be quite slippery, and this is a main defense for them, they are very slow. Their top speed is 0.18 miles per hour, which is around 0.3 kilometers per hour. And that is with them really kicking up the nitrous. A slug would need to continuously scurry along the ground for over 6 days or 145 hours straight in order to walk the same distance that me and you walk every day. For these creatures, running or rather slithering or sliding is not the best option for defense, and so they have to rely on hiding, on their protective mucus, and on the nature that they are slippery. But not all slugs are small. There are some slug species that can reach up to 32 pounds, just over 14 kilos. How about the banana slug in the United States, which can grow up to one foot in length, around 32 centimeters? There are some sea slugs, like the Californian black sea hare, that can weigh up to 30 pounds, or that 13.6 kilos. It suffices to say that slugs have a great amount of variation in their species, and I am so excited to go through one by one in the future. Some land slugs can even amputate parts of their body in order to bait predators away. They will take off their tail, for example, and then slowly flee to safety. Some sea slugs have other parts of their body that they can just take off and leave for predators, 
but keep in mind that not all sea slugs and not all land snails can do these things. It is only a testament or witness to the great variety within the slug. An important aspect of all slugs, however, is that they are invertebrates. This means they have no backbone, they have no vertebral column like me and you have. But this is not even the full story. Not only do they not have a backbone, but they have no bones at all. They don't have a spine, but they also don't have bones for arms. They don't have a skull. They have a good deal of soft and cushy organs on the inside, ones that can take the kind of twisting around that they do. Bones, however, could not allow for such flexibility in creatures like this. In fact, the body of a slug is just a huge muscle. This huge muscle contains more muscles on the underside of it. All of these contract in such a way that allows them to go forward like a wave on a beach. This may look like a gelatinous little creature, quite literally like organic jello, but just know that as far as nature is concerned, they are jacked. There are human bodybuilders out there that want as much muscle as possible. Well, the slug can just say, I am muscle. Although I do not know many people that would aspire to the physique of a slug, my point still stands. Take with that muscle thousands and thousands of teeth, and you have actually quite an unassuming little predator. There are slugs like the ghost slug that hunts worms. There are sea slugs that also like to hunt, even attacking other fellow slugs. And there are land slugs that will track other slugs by their mucus trails. And so being the same size as this creature and looking them straight in those tentacles of theirs, I imagine it to be a frightening sight. An interesting question is to ask, how do slugs breathe? They have something that looks sort of akin to a blowhole that some creatures in the sea have. This is actually a pore, spelt P-O-R-E, that is called a pneumostome. Keep in mind that this is referring to the land-living slugs, not the sea slugs. They have their own unique anatomy that we will cover in a future episode. And so, while there are many slugs out there that are fearsome predators in their own way, there are many slugs that are also predators as regards your garden. They'll eat your veggies and become the invaders of your little project, such as the leopard slug or the Spanish slug. These are typically invasive, and without any of their native prey, will eat whatever they can find, which includes your very nice zucchini, all the meanwhile leaving special gifts of parasites that can cause things like meningitis. I'm sure that if they understood they were eating the zucchini you have worked so hard for, they would decide not to. But these slimy little guys are hungry and will eat just about anything. Perhaps something we should have covered right at the top, but I think we should cover now, is the distinction of what exactly makes a slug or a snail. This is a little complicated and not as easy as we would like. We are quick to point out anything that looks like a snail that doesn't have a shell is a slug, but that is not always the case. There are many gastropods that don't have a shell ever. There are even a lot of slugs that actually do have shells. They are just not on the outside. They are hidden like a kind of plate inside their body. And so are many slugs really shell-free? Well, no. They are shell-free as regards the outside. It is the snail that has that very hardy carapace on the outside, and many slugs prefer a different kind of armor. And so it seems that the classification of slugs or snails is a bit of a spectrum and mixed up. In terms of reproduction, slug species have such a different amount of eggs that they lay per year or even per batch. Some can lay as little as three, while some lay up to 80. And now let us move on to the last fact of the episode. 
Slug. Where does that word come from that we use? The term slug was coined in 1704, and it was used to describe a shellless land snail. It was originally used to describe somebody who was a lazy person, perhaps slow, and this was as early as the 15th century. You may know the term sluggard, for example. And it eventually went from a description of people to slow-moving animals by the 1610s. Usually this is the time where I read a dad joke that has to do with the animal. I unfortunately could not find one that didn't physically hurt to read. And while I believe that many dad jokes ought to inflict some amount of emotional damage or pain because of how bad the joke is, all the jokes that I read simply crossed the line. And even for me, as one who loves dad jokes, who has been told by many people that dresses like a dad, you know that these jokes were bad. And now let us move on to the review of the episode. This review is coming from Izzy, who has written all the way from the United States of America. And Izzy writes, Just wondering, how are you doing? Thanks for doing a joke segment for me. I guess, sorry Izzy, I didn't do one today, but at least you know why. Izzy continues, Also, can you please do more episodes? There are so many animals you haven't done. Jack Rabbit, Leatherback Turtle, Taylor Swift, Antelope, Chicken, Catfish, Bumblebee, Ladybird, and also, I don't mean to be rude. Now, I would have included my laughter in the show, but I didn't want to wake anybody. I'm unsure if Izzy is referring to Taylor Swift as an animal, or if there is an animal that is named after Taylor Swift. I'm not sure. I think if I was to do an episode on Taylor Swift, I would probably get a lot of angry emails. But yes, Izzy, I agree, there are so many animals that I haven't done. And I would absolutely love to do more episodes. In fact, I would love it if Relax With Animal Facts was my full-time job. I would love to just do maybe two episodes a week every week. But at the moment, there is just no financial warrant for it. I do my best to be punctual with episodes, but as has been seen the past few weeks, that hasn't happened as I would like it to. And so I can only say that in the future, I hope that this show does become something that I can do absolutely full time. That I can dedicate all my time to posting episodes, to maybe doing video podcasts writing articles for the website, and so I can only say that if that is something that you would like for the show, your support on things like Patreon are ways in which this can actually happen. But until that happens, I am going to do my best to be punctual and to get out episodes like the chicken, the catfish, the bumblebee, I think we did the bumblebee actually, and maybe even do the jackrabbit or the Taylor Swift. Thank you, Izzy, for your wonderful review. And if the show helps you at all, leaving a review like Izzy did is one of the biggest ways that you can help the show grow. If you would like to request an animal for a future episode, you can do so by going to relaxwithanimalfacts.com and going to the Animal Request tab. You just go to the Submit portion and click on that Animal Request section. If you would like to reach out to me, Steph Wolf, for any other reason, you can do so by going to the Instagram Relax With Animal Facts or by sending an email to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com. Again, you can go to the Patreon Relax With Animal Facts. There are tons of episodes, exclusive episodes you haven't heard before that are waiting for your listenership, and I am looking forward to making many more. I am currently working on one that is a dinosaur, and I will not spoil it. A huge shout out to George Vlad for the ambiance that was used in this episode. Again, his YouTube is in the description, and I encourage you to check him out. The resources that were used in this episode came from a to z animals.com, mentalfloss.com, britannica.com, and etimonline.com. Those are also in the description for your exploration. What an amazing animal we have covered today. 
again, one that is quite unsuspecting, even one that is treated, I would say, with some contempt among many. Who cares about slugs, I'm sure some people think. But within their unassuming, slimy little bodies are a host of very unique characteristics that we have learned about together. Thank you all for joining me on this episode, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode with the next animal. Take care.